Thank you, everyone. Um, I was just marveling at the irony with the organizers at starting late when we're talking about personality disorders and bad boundaries. Just a bit of fun, though. Just before I start, I'd like to um, make something clear because I know this is being um, recorded and, um, and might be watched by whomever. And that is that um, through the presentation, I will often just refer to personality disorders rather than the um, more acceptable um, individuals or people experiencing personality disorder. And the reason for that is that I'm not focusing on individual um, presentations, individual people. Um, we're going to be prioritising talking about um, uh, PDs as a um, presenting issue. So we're not talking about the people. Um, I say that just so that there's no offence taken. Right. What are we going to cover? I did discover today that the, um, the presentation is about half the length, so I've got about half the length um, that I thought I had. So I've got more than 60 slides here. We'll just get through as much as we can. And these will be made available. What's the source? All right, so first of all, we need to talk about some of the very recent research that looks at um, whether personality disorders should be thought about as the discrete categories that we all understand um, and recognise from the DSM, or whether we're looking at something of a common thread across personality disorders. You may have heard of the um, characteristics versus dimensions debate. So the DSM has 10 discrete categories and one of the concerns that um, people have with the categorical nature of that is that there's quite a lot of comorbidity in personality disorders, which means that a lot of people, um, if you do a um, structured assessment with them, will meet the criteria for more than one personality disorder. So similarly to intelligence research, the, the latest um, studies in the area are uh, looking at whether we can pick out a general factor um, similar to general intelligence that kind of threads its way through all personality pathology and then perhaps some specific factors that are either partially um, or not related that might help us work out why some people present in some characteristic ways versus others. There's quite an important study that was done is I'm going to have problems with this all the way through. But a, quite an important study by Sharp and colleagues. And what they did was they had a look at a very large sample, about 960 people, and um, did skids with all of them, and worked out that there was a very high correlation between many of the uh, disorders. You can see that in the correlations here. However, the way they worked that out was they used what's called a confirmatory factor analysis. And the issue with a confirmatory factor analysis is that before you run the um, statistical test, you have to tell the package how you expect it all to um, work out. So we say, okay, these criteria that are under the borderline personality disorder um, page of the DSM ought to be the ones that load on borderline personality. And these are the narcissistic ones, and so they ought to load on narcissistic personality. So we stipulate that ahead of time. And even when we do that, they overlap quite substantially. They then ran the same data with an exploratory factor analysis, which basically doesn't stipulate where the criterion should sit. It says whatever they load on, it loads on. And what they found was that a lot of the factors, um, about half of the factors under some of the, the disorders, actually loaded significantly on a number of diagnoses. Right? And when we allow that to happen, the factors that then emerge are very independent. So, so long as we treat them as being discrete, they overlap a lot. If we allow them to kind of, uh, the criterion to naturally predict which disorders they fall under, we suddenly get much less uh, dependence between, or correlation between the diagnoses. So basically what that tells us is that PD symptoms, as they look in the DSM, are actually naturally related to more than just one category of diagnosis, right, put simply. 
They then ran a third way of putting this through where they stipulated that there would be a general factor and let the program work out which of the criteria matched this general factor across all of the diagnoses and said, but we're going to have specific um, smaller factors unrelated to that general factor that will predict then whether people fall into a borderline category or a narcissistic category, etc. And have a look at what they found. I don't know if you can see this, but actually across all of the uh, material, across all the criteria, there were very high factor loadings on this general factor. And the general factor itself was uncorrelated with any of the specific factors. So 0 0.00 correlations for all of them. Right, so what this tells us is that actually there is something generally the matter across personality disorders, but that it doesn't explain everything. Then have a look at this. When we look at specific factors, what's this general factors account for? So in antisocial personality disorder, for example, then at that point, 100% of the antisocial criteria are loaded on a single specific factor. Right, so we're acknowledging that this picture is a little more complex than just a bunch of categories. Another interesting thing happened when they ran this. The borderline personality disorder category disappeared completely. So it was entirely subsumed by this general factor. What that means is when you do this, there's no borderline personality disorder. And this was the best fitting model as well, compared to the CPA or the EPA, uh, the EFA. Um, that was stipulated as the best, statistically the best model. So we only have hypotheses at the moment because of how new this is about what this general factor represents. But I think we have to think about it also in terms of this additional finding that borderline personality disorder criteria are somehow very well related. They're subsumed by this general factor. So if we think about that, there's a few possibilities. The first is that um, BPD criteria may actually represent something of the underpinning difficulty um, that's experienced by people with borderline personality disorder. And that that might relate to something to do with the, the fact that BPD is unique in that it um, covers both self and interpersonal dysfunction in its criteria list. The second possibility is that it might indicate something of the severity of personality disorders. So we know that there's a number of core underlying pathology. I'll come back to this slide, but... <clears throat> so we know there's a number of core underlying pathology. So if we're talking about personality disorders, we understand that there's a lack of resilience particularly in relation to psychosocial stress only, that that tends to underpin personality disorder. We know that there's an oversensitivity in relation to psychosocial um, situations and that people with personality disorder have great difficulty under stress and particularly attachment stress at um, reliably interpreting people's minds. In fact, they have difficulty reliably interpreting what's going on in their own minds as well. Traditionally, this has kind of been thought of as BPD, but actually this seems to underpin all personality disorder to some degree. We know that there's an inability to forgive or to put out of mind traumatic memories or upsetting memories. So if we think of this P factor, this general factor, as being something of a um, resilience factor or a lack of resilience factor, then it may be something of a psychological equivalent to an immune system vulnerability. And so that what we're saying is the combination of historic experiences and developmental processes that have produced what ends up being called a personality disorder has left the person with something of an immune vulnerability in their psychological functioning. Go back to this. Bear in mind, these are, you know, what I'm saying here is hypothetical in that these are our best guesses at the moment based on very new research.
if this is the case, it does raise a couple of practical issues. And one in particular, I think, is um, a pro and another that's a con. The pro is um, that since there's a whole bunch of uh, research on treatment for borderline personality disorder, which mostly has been because there's more people who present and get captured by research who have borderline personality disorder. What it means is that if borderline personality disorder somehow um, represents a, the common thread that um, is consistent across personality disorders, then there's something of a starting point for us already in what we know um, in terms of research and practice that we can then build on using the specific factors for our treatments. Right? So we can learn something about the treatment of borderline personality disorder that at least to some degree is related to what we'll be presenting in other personality disorders. So that's a, that's a pro, of course. Um, the con is that whilst it's all well and good for us to talk about a general factor and specific factors, actually if you think about how you might go about talking to a patient about that, it all of a sudden becomes very tricky. You know, there's something um, um, nice and neat about the ability to sit down with a patient and talk to them about their borderline personality diagnosis, which means that they have these sorts of difficulties that they can very much relate to. Or to someone about their antisocial personality sort of diagnosis. Again, there's a specific um, identified criteria that many can relate to. <coughs> so I guess one of the practical issues we have to think about moving forward in relation to this is if these things are dimensional and there's good evidence that they're better represented dimensionally, how do we go about actually making that useful in terms of you know, translating that into what we do in practice? So certainly that can help us to develop treatments that are based on this general um, characteristic and some of the specific aspects. But there's a little bit of a question about how useful it might be to somehow try and get across to someone in the midst of crippling interpersonal and self um, issues, the complexity of some kind of general factor or the specificity of um, certain factors applying to them or not applying to them. You know, so there is something of a clinical utility, I think, to the DSM categories that at this point, um, despite this being a better representation of the state of play, I don't think does away with our need for um, using these discrete categories. Right, so what I'm going to argue in this presentation is that operationally there's a very specific ability that we're saying is vulnerable or impaired that forms the threat um, for personality disorders and that is the capacity to mentalize. And what that means is that the most helpful treatments will at least partially consider the improvement of the patient's mentalizing ability as being central to the treatment. So I won't assume that you know what that is. I'll um, talk about mentalizing next. All right. There's a very quick introduction to this. Okay, so to start off with, um, mentalizing can be a tricky thing to wrap one's head around so, and it can be easier to think about what it would be like if the opposite were true. So have a think about what it might be like to live in a mind-blind world. There's a world where there's absolutely no sense for you that there's anything underpinning behaviour. That means you've got no sense that thoughts exist or that feelings exist or that people have desires or intentions. In fact, imagine that you didn't even know anything about those existing for yourself. And try and picture what the world might actually look like through your eyes if you didn't have access to these things. I think what it might end up looking like is a bit of a stimulus-driven chaotic mess that might end up um, creating something similar to the kind of the stimming that we see in um, people with autism. You know, very stimulus driven kind of the moment is what exists and there's nothing beyond that kind of experience. The reason for that is because our mental states <coughs> make our behavior um, understandable. 
even when we use very, very basic, unsophisticated attributions about what underlies people's behaviour, such as the sort of unsophisticated um, assumptions that many people with personality disorders make under stress, we're still attributing something mental to um, preceding behaviour. We're assuming it comes from somewhere. So mentalising is exactly this thing. It's our ability to imagine what precedes behaviour. Our ability to have a sense in our minds, or bring a sense to our minds, of what it is that's making me do what I'm doing, or what it is that's making other people do what they're doing. For example, how difficult is it for you to have a fairly good idea about the mental states that this person is experiencing in each of the pictures. It's automatic, isn't it? It's, an, it's a skill that you're able to use without actually having to put any cognitive or attentional resource into it. What's the first picture I feel in? Surprise, maybe angry. It might depend on where you're seated in terms of how close you are to it. The second one? Disgust. Disgust. Third one? Scared. What was some of them? Fear. Yeah. Fourth? Happy. Fifth? Sad. Sixth? Surprise. Okay. How easy is that? So, most of the time, when stress is low, we're actually able to very implicitly, very automatically, read people's minds and pick up what's in people's minds. Except, even for the sophisticated people in this room, sometimes we can't do that. Sometimes an apparent lack of cues can mean that at best we have to guess what's in a person's mind. What's this child feeling? Or longing. Or longing. <laughs> even at that moment, it's two totally different mental states coming to your mind. It's all sorts of things. And this gets at a second aspect of mentalizing, and that is that because sometimes cues are ambiguous, in order to mentalize other people and to be mentalized, we actually have to engage in an innately collaborative process. So our capacity to interact and to rely on you to update me about what's going on for you is dependent. It is centrally important for us to be able to have accurate ideas about what's in other people's minds. We need to be able to share our minds with each other. So mentalizing doesn't always have to be explicit. What I'm saying is it's this implicit thing that we do all the time as well. But at times it's our ability to be able to do it explicitly like with that child to be able to actually cognitive resources to, to it and to ask someone and to think about it and to wonder ourselves about what might be going on. It's that ability that determines whether we're driven by affective processes under stress to make our attributions or more thoughtful reflective processes. Right. And Patrick Lytton has um, done some quite interesting uh, neurobiological research to show that this process isn't just unidimensional. So it's not just a matter of can you do it or can you not, unfortunately. Um, and that means that for personality disorder patients it's also not a matter of just can you do it or can you not. It's a fragmented skill in that you don't have a singular capacity to mentalize. Each of us will have particular vulnerabilities psychosocially that um, uniquely or idiosyncratically reduce our capacity to mentalize or inhibit it. So mentalizing is considered across these four dimensions. These, each of these dimensions is neurobiologically based um, and what we know is that over-reliance on one side of a dimension tends to be used strategically by the brain to correct for an inability to utilize or an under uh, a lower capacity to utilize the other. So for example, under stress, characteristically, a person with borderline personality disorder will become 
highly affect focused. In fact, in a rigid way that's hard to shift. It's very difficult to get that person to consider possibilities, which is an innately cognitive notion. The person will become very focused on the other very often. This characteristic BPD patient. Very focused on hypervigilant, in fact, to pick up cues in the other that um, prove the attributions that are being made. And what's suggested is that the reason that occurs is because the capacity to engage flexibly at the other end of the spectrum is compromised at those times. So treatment, very simply put, aims to increase the ability of the person to flexibly move across these dimensions under stress, when ordinarily they would become very fixed. In fact, if you or your patients or anyone were able to retain flexibility on this through most situations, you would be a roughly resilient person with good mental health. If when major stresses hit you, you're able to hold both the affect of the situation and think about it, if you're able to hold in mind what's going on for you and think about the other person, if you're able to move between implicitly trusting what you're coming to and explicitly thinking about what's occurring, then you're engaging in resilient actions. By virtue of your ability to do that, you're likely not to be hit as strongly by the emotional consequences of whatever's occurring. Right. And this is a nice diagram, so I include it because it has a bit of an indication to um, some of the conceptual cousins of mentalizing. And these, these cousins are somewhat related to mentalizing, but mentalizing is a more complex construct that captures all of it. All right. So we've gotten at some of this. Minds are opaque. I can't read your mind. I can only have guesses about what's going on. Similarly, you can't read my mind. We have to engage in some sort of collaboration in order to get close to what might be going on. We can make inferences about them. Inferences are prone to error. And in fact, the more we rely on emotional reasoning to make sense of what's going on, the more prone to error our inferences will be. So as a basic kind of fundamental underpinning principle for treating people who experience great vulnerability in this, we have to make sure that we model persistent curiosity about mental states. We have to make sure that we are persistently inquisitive rather than certain about what's going on in other people's minds. Which actually probably most of you do when you're not stressed in the therapy room anyway. The reason it's worth making explicit when we're talking about working with personality disorder is because I'm sure you're all aware with personality disorder when their mentalizing falls apart can tend to impact in us that, that impact us in ways that increase our arousal, make us fall apart a little bit. Alright. So that was a kind of crash course in what mentalizing is and there's much more detail we can go into. But as a basic recap, mentalizing is, and this is separate from mentalization based treatment, this is just a, a developmental factor, a, an ability of the brain. Mentalizing is the ability that gives behavior meaning. It's the utilization of this ability that allows us to interpret our own behavior as meaningful and to interpret other people's behavior as meaningful. But because it's a developmental skill, <coughs> as I've already alluded to, um, it can be impaired under stress. So let's have a look at how that happens. I don't think there's any relation between where I point this and whether it's a slide. 
All right, so many of you are maybe familiar with the Reading the Mind in the Eyes task developed by Barry and Cohen. In, that, in this task, for those of you who aren't, you get presented with a shot of a person's eyes and four possibilities and you have to pick the mental state that you think is being uh, displayed in the eyes. Nolte and colleagues um, used this in a very interesting way to look at mentalizing failures. They had people, um, BPD uh, patients and controls, um, look at eyes and judge um, mental state and in control position look at eyes and judge age, which of course has nothing to do with mental states. And what they did was they did this under a number of conditions. The first condition was that they had them um, um, imagine and share a personal story with the researchers in which they had experienced an 8 to 10 out of 10 stress that wasn't relational. So they had them, you know, some of them talked about times when they've missed a flight or um, when they've um, been experienced um, severe financial hardship and then received an additional bill. So people develop personalized stories, personalized images <coughs> of situations that were an 8 to 10 out of 10 in terms of subjective distress. Then they developed a second image, a second image script for a time when they'd experienced a relationship related stress that was an 8 to 10 out of 10. Okay. And people identify things like um, being kicked out of home, breaking up with someone um, after a long term relationship, losing someone important and those kinds of things. And they had them do this task once without any of the imagery being used once with the non-relationship stress <coughs> and once with the relationship stress. Does that make sense? Okay. What they found okay. what they found was that when there was no imagery being used they were all very accurate at doing this task. They were all very accurate at reading the mind in the eyes up here about 60%. Some of them are very tricky ones, so 60% is quite good on the task. When they had to imagine a 8 to 10 out of 10 stressor that was non-relational, there was a significant drop in how well they did. They were less able to make accurate attributions, this is controls as well, less able to make accurate attributions about the mental state being depicted. And then when they had an attachment or a relationship-based stressor, bear in mind that there was no difference in the subjective ratings um, between the attachment and non-attachment stressors. The participants experienced them as equally distressing in terms of their subjective ratings. But after relationship stressors, there was again a significant drop in how well they performed this task. So what this tells us is that even in normal people, Normal everyday stress, as it becomes more severe, impacts mentalizing, impacts your ability to read minds accurately. And relationship stress impacts it even further. So we're talking here about people who actually don't have um, significant uh, histories of um, trauma and neglect and whatever else that might even make this um, more difficult. So what shuts down our mentalizing? Basically the same things that make infants and children feel um, afraid, that activate the attachment system. Um, experiences on the inside, illness, stress, fatigue, physiological arousal, shut down mentalizing. And things around us in our environment that are frightening or threatening shut down our mentalizing. Conflict in relationships, um, separation, risks of being hurt. However, what this research tells us is that attachment stress trumps all other hands. That that is innately uh, more problematic for our ability to tune accurately into minds.
So the um, very intelligent um, mentalizing researchers um, looked at a little bit more neurobiological evidence and they've come up with this and what this shows is that um, is the um, move between neural systems that underpins our mentalizing. So basically, when your arousal is very low, let's say you're sitting at the dinner table and um, your partner's at, um, at the table doing something else while you're eating, nothing much is happening, your arousal is pretty low, you're probably engaging in very little mentalizing or mind reading at that point. If something happens to increase our arousal. <coughs> Let's say your partner suddenly slams the table, steps up and leaves, stands up and leaves the room. All of a sudden, our brains will tend to switch to prefrontal systems and we will start to allocate deliberately attentional resources to try to work out what's the matter. Does that sound reasonable to you? So suddenly you're orienting to what's occurring and you're trying to think, what's going on? What could be happening? You're reading the facial cues. Is it something about me? Has something happened? After this, though, if arousal continues to go up, so we have this explicit, initially we have this um, increase in our explicit mentalizing to a point, and that improves our performance at reading minds. After it hits a particular point, it starts to impede our cognitive abilities and then it reaches a switch point where what happens is the prefrontal um, activity shuts off in favor of lower limbic activity and me mentalizing of a sort, mind reading of a sort, increases again. Only this time, rather than being related to explicit cognitive processes that are trying to make sense of what's going on, <coughs> It's related to massive amounts of affect. And the room is being read on the basis of that affect, rather than on the basis of cognitive um, sense making. Sounds like my marriage. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. So this is an ordinary process, but people can differ in um, varying ways in the way this occurs. So. Um, for example, the amount of arousal it might take somebody in order to undergo that switch varies. And we would imagine that someone with a characteristic borderline personality disorder, for example, might not need too much arousal in certain situations, such as important relationship situations, for that switch to occur, for a shift to purely emotional reasoning to kick in. People can also have different levels, of course, of performance. Some of us are better at mentalizing in certain situations than others. And the third thing that can differ is that when arousal, well, when the threatening stimulus disappears, the speed at which arousal reduces so that we're able to re-engage cognitive mentalizing varies between people. Some people are out of action for a very long time. Just to apply that practically immediately to therapy, the common um, saying with personality disorders is to strike when the iron has cooled. And that's just simply because it will probably take a little while for this person to be unaroused enough to be able to re-engage in any sort of reasonable sense-making of what's occurred. So you do it next session or whenever the arousal has dropped enough that you can actually do something with this. And in short, so, so in short, non-mentalizing, which is this thing we're trying to reduce in our patients, but also in, in us when we're with them, is basically any absence of openness, curiosity, or imagination of our minds. So when we get certain about what's going on in the minds of our personality disorder patients, as many of us do, it's an example of non-mentalizing kicking. When we're certain that they're um, they have no interest in understanding us. Or when we're um, certain that they're not trying hard enough to 
to get better, which might sound silly in a room like this, but actually when emotions are high, when one's treating somebody, um, these thoughts do cross one's mind. There are examples of non-mentalizing, it's where we've shifted our interest and open curiosity, and it's become, in minds, and it's become closeness or certainty or knowing about minds. All right. Now I'm going to move on. That clock is my enemy. Okay, so I want to talk just briefly about uh, what's called the alien self because it's very important for personality to sort of work. How is it that you're able to work out when you're feeling angry? How are you able to distinguish that? from feeling sad? Yeah, it's just been in my body. Yeah. And you probably come up with some vague description of what that means that might not make any sense to anyone else sitting here because it's basically based on something automatic. You just simply recognize it. In fact, how, do you, how are you able to... So those are quite distinct emotions. How are you able to tell the difference between being enraged, angry, or just a little bit irritated? somehow you are, right? And this is based on the process of what we call um, forming internal representations of our emotions. How do we do that? Via mirroring, early on in life. So the usual process, an amazing process, the usual process is that an infant or a child experiences a mental state that is uncontained. It's not recognised. There's no ability to judge for the infant that this is um, anger that I'm feeling because mum's just left the room. It's just a messy state on the inside. What happens is that an adult around the infant is able to accurately tune into that state, to apprehend it, so to speak, but to accurately recognise it, and to give back to the child something of an indication of the recognised state. And this happens totally normally. Mothers will very, very naturally, as long as they're not depressed, will very, very naturally you know, put their bottom lip out when their baby's crying. Oh, what's wrong? You know, there's a very marked, obvious indication that, there's a, that I recognise you're feeling sad and I'm giving it back to you. This process allows the baby to recognize their mental state and to store something of an experience of seeing it on the inside. So that when this happens over and over and over again, we're gradually able to build a sense that this thing in particular is related to this feeling. So we internalize the mirrored response and we're then able to draw on it implicitly to recognize it when it occurs in ourselves as we age. Does this make some sense to you? Okay, so when we're talking about personality disorder, we're usually talking about trauma and neglect and or neglect backgrounds. So the question comes up, what happens when this person either fails to recognize what's going on on the inside, or when this person is so overcome themselves or so triggered by what they're seeing that what they give back is something totally different? those fair questions? What results is that rather than internalizing a recognizable version of my affect, what's internalized is something that's not related to my affect, actually. Right? So for example, the baby might be crying and in a traumatic situation, um, and all happens for all of us normally, but if this was to happen over and over again, if mum was to see the crying and yell at the baby, why are you trying to drive me mad? You know, so there's something of a personalizing and what's being fed back to the baby is actually mum's uncontained mental state rather than a mirrored response that is related to, contingent to, baby's <coughs> state. What happens is the child is unable to find him or herself but still has to put something in the gap that's been created in the inside. And so it's a little bit like taking a square peg and shoving it into a round hole. And when this happens over and over and over again, 
what occurs is that when a primary affect <coughs> is felt, what gets stimulated is a secondary affect that actually doesn't feel like it fits. It feels tormenting. So, for example, an overwhelming sense of disgust in oneself <coughs> as a result of having feelings of sadness. And the person may not actually have the um, psychological mindedness to recognise I was sad and I'm feeling disgusted with myself. Actually, what usually happens is that they're just overcome by the secondary state. And unfortunately, because that's what's stored where that um, original primary affect ought to have been stored, it becomes an uncontainable um, aspect of my experience. So every time I have sadness stimulated, or every time, if you're thinking antisocial personality disorder, every time I feel a threat to my integrity or to my sense of myself as being strong and capable, what is triggered is an unmanageable feeling that feels tormenting from the inside out. A painful secondary feeling. It's called the alien self because it's a, it feels like a part of me that is alien, that doesn't belong. It's a square peg where a round one ought to be. And I'm, of course, using language to talk about something that actually is entirely pre-conscious or unconscious in that it's not able to necessarily be recognised as a process that's occurring. How do people cope with these tormenting, painful, alien parts of self? The easiest way to cope with it is to project it into someone else. So rather than experiencing in a horrifying way my own foundational badness, I can imagine that you're bad instead. And in fact, in severe cases, I can treat you so much like you're bad that it ends up stimulating in you, stimulating you to do something that proves that you're bad. Right? So I can be so tormenting in my shoving this tormenting thing into you that you can actually respond in ways that aren't like you. And the reason you're responding in ways that aren't like you is because it is an alien bit right, that is being forced into you. The square peg is being forced into your round hole. Is it possible as well that personality disordered people are really, really good at that? Absolutely. If, I mean, if you think of this as being a kind of um, last defence against being overcome by unmanageable pain, mm -hmm. one has to be good at it. Mm -hmm. But there's an, there's an added bit of complexity to this because as we go about the normal process of ageing, what happens when adolescence hits? A normal desire for increased autonomy mm -hmm. uh, begins to emerge, doesn't it? However, in order to engage in this projective identification, in order to make you feel the thing that I can't feel, I actually need you close. It's much easier to treat someone in a way that causes them to react um, to prove I'm right if they're with me. So as I need greater space, there's this double bind for people. And this is actually, I think, why personality disorder first becomes recognisable in adolescence. Because the natural process that means that I want more distance from my objects, ends up meaning that I have to act much louder, so to speak, in order to remove this feeling, in order to externalise this feeling. So I need to harm myself, or I need to be violent, or I need to do things that are very loud behaviours so that I can continue to externalise, so that I can continue to not have to feel what it is that I can't tolerate feeling this alien feeling. So thus, observable personality disorder emerges. And these things are happening beforehand, but parents have ways of um, making attributions about a child's naughty behaviour or whatever else that kind of get one through. It gets worse with adolescence. So what's needed in terms of a corrective process in dealing with these alien parts of self that inevitably we come to have to experience 
um, by virtue of the fact that we're developing a, an attachment relationship with this patient. The first is that an attachment relationship has to develop because that's the kind of um, pre-requirement for this projective process to start occurring. It ends up being those who are most important to the person who wear the feelings most often. The second thing is that in the midst of feel, being made to feel horrible ourselves or frightened or shameful or not good enough or whatever it is, we have to be able to tolerate, and this is a big thing, tolerate the affect that the other person cannot. I.e., can you tolerate being viewed and actually being left feeling yourself like you're a terrible therapist? Can you tolerate being made to feel so that it actually feels like you're feeling it, like you just don't care enough about the person, or that you are a cold therapist? These are not parts of our identity that we typically are used to feeling in the therapy room, which means that we do what that person does, but we've got better skills at it. We try and externalise these feelings that are awful, so we reassure the person, or we act in ways that are punitive, or so that we can control this awful feeling process. And we do all sorts of things that mean that we don't have to go on feeling this. So the question is, if you're dealing with people for whom there has been a breakdown in that mirroring exchange, can you tolerate being made to feel personally the unmanageable affect? And can you, in the midst of tolerating that, still engage in a mentalizing, curious fashion with the person? So whilst you are being viewed, in the worst case of this I had, I won't talk about specific examples too much because it's being video, but the worst case I had was um, um, a case where I found myself second guessing every bloody paraphrase that I made. You know, where I'm sitting there thinking, oh, that was the worst paraphrase I've ever done. And I thought, oh, another closed question, Matt, what the hell? <laughs> And whilst that's kind of funny to say here, it actually felt tormenting to be in the room with this person in immense pain and to feel like everything that I was offering was just completely substandard. Mm. And so the question is, can I tolerate that and persist in my curiosity about what it's like for the other person? Explore in a real way how it is for them to sit with someone who is so in it what it's like to be emotionally vulnerable with someone who just can't seem to do anything right. You know, doing that for real, not in a cognitive way, an intellectual way, but actually doing that for real in a way that tolerates and, and treats the affect, and allows the affect to stay, is very difficult. And then of course we'd be hoping that we do that enough in the therapeutic environment that we can then start to ask them to try um, to hold their ability to think about what things are like gradually in their broader social uh, environment. And that last one's a particular challenge because a lot of the research suggests that um, great gains can be made in the therapeutic relationship for 50 minutes a week that never end up changing anything in the um, broader social realm. So social learning, we're going to explore that in uh, next, because there is an additional bit to this that I want to cover. All right. So gone are the days when we can kid ourselves that attachment is the, um, the theory to beat all theories, the one ring to rule them all, and um, because what we really know is that if we stop kidding ourselves and look at what's really going on, it's not actually so um, culturally universal. And in fact, if you look at the history of being a child or an infant in the human race, it's actually not a very pleasant history. Um, and given various cultural experiences, 
um, parents have not always been primed to uh, impart a secure attachment experience to their children. So we know that attachment is actually just part of something broader that doesn't explain everything. What is universal is the question we need to ask ourselves. And the thing that is universal is trust, is being able to impart to our children something about what it means to be adaptive in our particular social or cultural environment. Which is something totally different when you're raised in Cottesloe than it is when you're raised in Armadale. When your parents have access to an awful lot of resources versus when your parents have had to make do and often that has meant um, keeping you in difficult situations. You don't have a choice of schools. You've been allocated the one in your catchment and even if there's significant bullying occurring and terrible responses to that, that's just the one you have to attend. And in fact, you're not even guaranteed that you're going to have parents who have the ability to tune into the feelings that arise from it. Right, so our cultural settings end up determining actually what it means uh, or, or what, what we need to develop in order to survive. In some situations, having an avoidant attachment is perfectly reasonable and in fact is a far better survival strategy than having a secure attachment. I tell you what, if Australia was suddenly to flip and be ruled by some kind of um, punishing dictator, it's not all the securely attached people that are going to be functioning nicely. Mm -hmm. So Fonagy suggests that we've got this broader system, actually he just puts the information together, benefits from everyone else's research, I hope he doesn't watch this. <laughs> a bit narcissistic to think he watch this. So, what we know is that there is this social signaling system, that we have various ways that we can learn things from our environment. And, um, I think this will be best to give you an example to explain. Let's say you're in a foreign country and you don't know anything about this country or its customs, you can't speak the language, and you see a woman over there and she's got a bottle of some sort, she tips it upside down, turns the cap right twice, left once, turns it back up, pulls it off and starts drinking. What would you learn from that? So you see a person, a woman in a foreign country, she's got a bottle, she's just over there somewhere, she tips it upside down, turns the cap twice, um, to the right, once to the left, flips it back up, pulls the top off and starts drinking. What do you learn from that? I would argue that it doesn't make intuitive sense to anyone sitting in this room. Her intentions in behaving that way are totally unknown, they're opaque, it's odd to see, so it's hard to interpret her intentions. And we can't be sure which part of this behavioural sequence that she's undertaken is actually related to what we think the end goal might be. For many of us would probably assume the end goal was to drink something from it. We're, we're even assuming that. So we can't work out what her intention is and we can't work out which part of the sequence is important. So you've got some um, reasonable questions available to you. Should you memorise the action sequence? Is the same sequence going to be relevant for opening all bottles in this country? Or just that particular type of bottle? Is what she's done something that is idiosyncratic to her, in which case it's irrelevant to you? Or is it actually a given social norm in this particular place? Is it the way the bottle's supposed to be opened? You know, these questions, on the basis of just seeing it, are hard to answer. And you've got strategies about them. You can go and use trial and error um, to open bottles and see what works. So you can uh, continue to observe people, more and more people, you know, gather some data and see how other people do it to inform you. But these things take time. What we have is a third system available to us that helps us to make behaviour intelligible. It's incredibly disruptive to have to wait, isn't it? I pause you and then... <laughs> We have what's called a, a, 
system that, or it's been named a natural pedagogy, which means an innate system for teaching and learning between people. And it's through this system that parents often impart much of what's important to know about relationships and about operating socially. So the system is triggered by what we call ostensive cues. So for example, if I say, Matt, this system is operated by ostensive cues. By virtue of the fact that I've pointed you out and used your name, which are two ostensive cues, I've indicated to you this is important to attend to. If the woman who you watched opening the bottle did this instead of just what I initially said, if she went, Would you learn more from it? <laughs> yes. Because she's used these ostensive cues to indicate, hey, I'm about to impart you something that's important and that is personally for you. And a mother does this with her baby quite naturally. The sorts of um, turn taking that a mother will engage in with a baby. Use of eye contact. Reacting contingently, which means when baby feels sad, mum shares something. It's not that mum does something before baby feels something, it's, it's that her response is based on what's come before from the baby. These kinds of cues activate this natural system and engage what's called our epistemic trust, which is basically like your openness to getting new information from the social environment and using it to update your templates. So by virtue of the fact that that lady has now used ostensive cues, you've been able to engage your epistemic trust, your openness to getting something from this, and you've been able to take what's important so that you can generalize it later. This is our epistemic trust system. And we don't just have a trust system, we appear to also have a vigilance system. I.e. kids aren't gullible. They don't believe everybody equivalently. And they don't believe all information equivalently. And this is functional because not everyone's intentions are good. Sometimes intentions are to deceive or mislead or to harm you. So epistemic trust enables the transmission of learning, but it's tempered by epistemic vigilance. Now this becomes relevant to working with personality disorders because we need to consider that the social information that has been received has resulted in epistemic mistrust, which means a general closedness to learning new things from the social environment, and for good reason. Because if I sacrifice the way I currently see things, I might just be making myself vulnerable to things that have hurt me previously. So a stance of mistrust in relation to learning new things about your, your intentions and, even, and then generalizing that to other people's intentions is unavailable. Engage in what's called epistemic hypervigilance often, which means that every situation needs to be judged for its own merits. Matt, so what were those cues that you said? Ostensive, Ostensive cues. Ostensive. Well, this is the other thing. A person, people with personality disorders will also often misinterpret your ostensive mm -hmm. cues. So that rather than being seen as something that is saying, this information is for you, you might be judged to actually be um, trying to open the person up to harm, which kind of perpetuates the, the closeness, the mistrust. <clears throat> Peter Fonagy has a lovely visual for this that I want to share with you because it portrays it so nicely. And this is getting, by the way, at the, the adaptivity of what it is we're treating. So openness to the social environment is typically adaptive. Here we have one flower that's open to the environment and one flower that's closed off from it. It's in a jar. 
Look at this, the rain comes along, and what happens to the flower that is closed off? It shrivels, right? Being open, like many of us probably are most of the time, is very functional because we learn all sorts of new things. We continue to adapt our templates in relation to our operating in the social world. I hope, I may just be assuming that. We may all be terribly bad at this. Come on. But hypervigilance is also adaptive sometimes. And when that's one's history, better be closed off from the rain than stomped on by the foot. Right? So a position of being closed, a position of mistrust, actually is adaptive given the historic experience. If you have a think about trauma, I won't spend too much time on this, but trauma basically is a horrible experience. It overwhelms our resilience and it violates any sense of the benevolence of the environment. It kind of insists that we respond with mistrust to similar instances in the future. So don't take it personally when people with personality disorders persistently treat you in ways that don't feel like you. I have the best of intentions for you. Or, or whatever else. Okay, so as I've said, leaves you with an inability to engage in a normal updating of your uh, social interpretation and functioning. Right. A little bit of research that underpins this. I won't explain the research too much, except to say that um, when we present people with borderline personality disorder with um, um, positive s pictures of people with positive states and negative states and pictures of the two combined so that it's ambiguous, what we find is um, that actually we have this thing that emerges where they're really much quicker than controls at reading mental states. But they're slower when it comes to, their reaction times are slower when they're asked to judge the trustworthiness of any pictures, and it slows much further when the person's face is ambiguous. And the sort of feedback they give is that person looks like they're mean harm, or that person um, just looks like there's something um, off about them. Judging neutrality or ambiguity is particularly difficult. And that they tend to rely on affective processes rather than cognitive processes to make those um, slow responses. Sorry, Matt, can I just ask? Yes. Uh, BPD is traditionally something that's been diagnosed mainly among women, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what are the rates among men, do you know? Personality disorders are partially gendered, mm. which means there does seem to, you know, seem to get more borderline personality disorder women and antisocial men, for example, that's what everyone thinks about. Um, instances are higher um, across the board. Um, and there, it's hard to distinguish what is a, um, a expectation based or culturally based uh, kind of component to that. You know, for example, it may be that the kind of thread that we're talking about as being a general lack of resilience is best expressed or most appropriately expressed in particular ways for, for women in a culture or like women. Yeah. Cyberball, you may know cyberball. Cyberball is a, a um, research task where the person's asked to throw a ball to on the screen to other players, only what they don't know is that the other players are computer operated. Right. And um, in cyberball ball experiments, they get 30 seconds to throw the ball around the group. And then they make all sorts of um, 
judgments after it. There are three conditions that these bits of research have tested. The first is an exclusion condition where regardless of whether you're in the control group or the personality disorder group, you receive the ball only at the beginning of the round and then the other players throw it. So you're entirely excluded. Second condition, um, all players receive exactly the same amount of ball tosses, both the person playing and the other players. Third condition, um, players are told at the start that there's a rule that the other players have to use to determine how much they receive the ball. So they're not allowed to decide who gets the ball, the other players have to obey the rule. And then what they do is they take um, estimations of the person's felt social rejection. When they only receive the ball at the start, there's no difference between the personality disorders and the control. They all feel excluded. When they receive an equal number of tosses between them, the control groups tend to look at what happened across the 30-second the trial. Did I generally tend to receive the ball? And their social judgments seem to be based on the general occurrence. People with personality disorders tend to judge every single instance. Did I receive the ball in that throw? <coughs> right. And what this means is that every ball throw, every interaction, every part of an interaction has to be judged in terms of its meaning for the person. And then interestingly in the control condition where everyone knows that a rule determines how many times they get the ball, uh, people with BPD still actually, despite knowing that, still tend to feel very rejected. More than controls and more than, um, yeah, and as much as the exclusion condition. Every social event requires mentalizing. They're not able to trust that they can generalize for the next instance based on what happened in the first instance. See what I mean? So even if they were to get the ball three times in a row, the next time is still going to take longer than for a control to judge the meaning of, of what occurred. They couldn't predict for you that they're going to get the ball the fourth time. Okay. Alright, so through the lens that we're talking about, we're kind of shifting what it means to have a personality disorder. We're saying that actually it's more like a social communication disorder. It's an issue in which it's hard to get new cultural information through to a person, past their epistemic mistrust. Right? Which means it's hard to do anything that actually makes significant and generalizable change. So the person is not just being difficult, they're actually hard to reach. It's hard to get through the mechanism across the divide, the communication divide. This can be very frustrating for therapists who try extremely hard and have fantasies of being the one to succeed where no one else has succeeded um, and can, as a result, sometimes blame or react punitively or in controlling ways um, with their patients. So let's have a think about treatment to close this off. There are lots of forms of specialised treatment and there's a bit of a dodo bird effect. You know the dodo bird in Alice in Wonderland? They run around and then the dodo bird declares that everyone did good, everyone's a winner. Well, what we find is that um, when we use meta-analyses to kind of even out the effect sizes in studies, I'm going to throw a dart at the board and it's got as good an effect size as the next one. That doesn't necessarily mean that all of these therapies are doing what they think they're doing and still getting the same effect, if you see what I mean. So, considering that, we should ask ourselves, what is it that's... So, we already said there's an underpinning thread that links the personality disorders. So, is it possible that there's an underpinning effect that we're able to have? Yes, thank you. You might have to do it for a long time based on this. <laughs> right, so the solution, many of us think, is this ability, lies with this ability, mentalizing. If we can somehow improve their curiosity about others' minds, 
if we can somehow open up this um, closed down epistemic trust via demonstrating over and over and over and over a um, curiosity and inquisitiveness in the face of whatever adversity they bring, then we think we might be able to improve epistemic trust at least in the therapeutic relationship long enough for some changes to occur there. Then the third bit is that we need to somehow, and this is where things are stuck at the moment actually, we need to somehow work to generalise the changes that occur in the relationship so that they make some sort of difference for the rest of the hours of the week uh, when the person's out doing their normal thing. fun picture. This is a picture of all the psychologists in the room when they're told that their special um, treatments uh, are all, all come down to the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice, we've got about five minutes left. Yes. Do you know what? The start was badly um, done. On You know, we started late, but I won't finish late. <laughs> This is basically what I've said, and you'll get the slides afterwards, you can look through it. Does everyone need specialist care? You know, do we all need to go and do a couple of years worth of upskilling so that we're very adherent in one of these specialised models and, and whatnot? The answer seems to be sort of, but not necessarily. In that, in, longitude, in this particular longitudinal study, for people who only met the criteria for a single personality disorder, good quality clinical management did no worse than specialised treatment. Wow. But as people became, um, um, as people met the criteria for two, three, and then four um, comorbid personality disorders, <coughs> specialised treatment uh, effects were increasingly observed. So what this means is that we probably need some adherent strategies for the very, very disturbed patients that we work with but that it's not necessarily required for all personality disorder work. So what does um, good quality, no brand care look like? And I'll finish on this. In the research it's called general psychiatric management, that's because it's published by psychiatrists. But um, it basically has these common factors. The first is that the person is treated by a primary clinician in that there is a single attachment relationship that is primary. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The second is that there is a structure to therapy, that clients are informed, it's not left mysterious as to the clinician's availability, the clinician's boundaries in terms of the therapy. The therapeutic frame is very explicitly set up. Diagnosis <laughs> is shared with the patient. And I know that there's still concerns around in some circles of psychology about um, whether we ought to be sharing such horrible diagnosis with people. Actually, there's no evidence that it does any harm, and in fact, the opposite. Mm. If you're trying to think from the other person's mind, it's often very encouraging to have some sort of a clear sense about what actually is going on in the midst of all this chaos. Is that true for uh, young people as well? Mm -hmm. Like children? Well, these disorders are primarily diagnosed in... Um, adolescence. Adolescence. Yeah. So you, you'd say it's helpful from like 12 onwards? Um, I would say that we're focusing only on personality disorders mm -hmm. here. And whilst I would probably share diagnoses for the sake of transparency and so that we're looking at the same thing, mm -hmm. all I'm prepared to kind of preach from here is that the evidence is that for personality disorders we ought to be sharing diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing that um, is often not done well um, is that a collaborative formulation has to be explicitly developed, i.e., you, um, you'll be able to access later slides where I give an example of this. You have to, some people do this verbally, some people write it. I think writing it is really helpful for these patients because if you have a no jargon formulation that says this is what I think is going on, then you can actually engage in a kind of mentalising dialogue where you try and work out the extent to which you can both come to some sort of a shared understanding that this is what's going on. 
and that then this is what we might need to do about it. So that's helpful as well. This provides some structure for people who experience quite a lot of chaos. Next, the clinician supports the patient. We accept the patient's subjective reality and run with it. And then strike when the iron's cold, right? So validation is better than some kind of good quality cognitive um, intervention. Um, it demands active effort for the patients. Patients are required to actually take responsibility for trying to change the way they behave, to try trying to manage their feelings in different ways. Certainly, they have to take responsibility for being the ones to share their mind with you. If you're left guessing, there is no point doing the work. Suicide threats and self-harm must be treated as priorities. So if risk changes and increases, we must put the therapeutic goals to one side and deal with this. And supervision is absolutely central because of the normal, horrible counter-transference that we experience when we're treating people with personality disorder. We must have help so that we can, because it will sometimes feel like it's coming from us, and it'll be hard to determine what's theirs and what's ours, and in the midst of that it's easy just to throw it all at the patient and say it's all theirs. Because of that, we must be committed to engaging in reflective supervision if we're working in this population. So in summary, I'll, I'll make this my summary. Can you tolerate being seen and treated in ways that don't match your view of yourself? Hey, that's related to the alien self. Can you predictably meet such misunderstanding with curiosity and an inquisitive stance? B. And can you model humility when you lose it? So, are you able to model a kind of explicit acknowledgement of your loss of this? I'll tell you what happens if you don't. The person with a personality disorder ends up thinking they're crazy and it's all about them. So, can you model what it is you're trying to get them to do, which is to take responsibility for Mm. messing up or misattributing something or just not being empathic because you were tired or whatever else. If this sounds like you, inquire with it. Then you cut out for the work. Thank you very much. amazing information there and we will make sure that we do get the slides to you. We'll send those out with the certificates for your PD hours. Um, we'll also in that email include some information on how you can access the video from this evening. Um, and if you haven't received a receipt for your payment this evening, do please see the Lord Nick um, and they will sort that out for you. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for attending everybody again. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.